Ladies and gentlemen, episode 60 is brought to you by Onnit. Onnit is a health and fitness juggernaut dedicated to delivering total human optimization to its vast customer base of athletes, thinkers, fitness gurus, and entrepreneurs. If you're interested in checking out the offerings from Onnit, I recommend you go over to Onnit, O-N-N-I-T dot com slash hot, like the opposite of cold, H-O-T. It's going to put you on the Cleared Hot landing page. You'll see the logo front and center at the, not the quite top of the page, and then the upper left of the page as well. You can scroll vertically down. It's going to start with that Onyx 6 body weight program, which I've talked about the last two episodes. It's another avenue to improve your fitness, absent going to a conventional or traditional gym. So not a lot of gear, not a lot of time. It's okay. Check it out. And then below that, it's going to start with all the supplements I've talked about at length, from the MCT oil to the Alpha Brain to the Total Human, which, again, I'm still loving day and night, starting with that Total Human. If you scroll across the top, you get everything from supplement, food, fitness, apparel, just about everything you can eat. But, as always, supplements aren't going to do it for you, right? They are the micro. For most people... They need to squarely focus their effort into the macro and get that dialed in. And then once you get going in the right direction, then start thinking about supplementation. All right, Get your momentum going first and then really start worrying about that micro. The last thing I would want people to do is to waste their money on something that they're not going to get the value out of. And the reality is, is that you, if you eat like a garbage disposal, which we all do, the supplements aren't going to do much. But if you can dial that in, then we're talking about that continued improvement with the supplements. So, onit.com slash hot. This episode is also brought to you by Free Range American. Many people will have asked me, well, what is Free Range American? And the best answer I have is that Free Range American is a brand that is dedicated and designed around celebrating the freedoms that we're incredibly lucky to have here in the United States. It is about, hopefully, motivating people to get out, be active, and use those freedoms that I think we should celebrate. And it doesn't have to be an adrenaline-based activity. It's just about you going out and, you know, trying to be a 1% better version of who you were yesterday through whatever pursuits and activities that speak to you. I have my own that I kind of like, and people uh, will raise their eyebrows at them from time to time, but it doesn't matter because that's just about me. This Free Range American is about you being you. Our motto, and actually it's not a motto, it is a mission statement, is do awesome shit. And speaking of that, we have a shirt that says exactly that. And it was out of stock for a long time, but it's back in stock. And in the next week or two, there will be a version of that shirt targeted and dedicated towards a community of individuals that help keep our freedoms exactly what they are. So if you want to check it out, freerangeamerican.us. And that's all the nuts and bolts that I need to cover before we get into this episode. My guest for today is Aaron Cross, or A.A. Ron, depending on what flavor of tea you like. Aaron is a veteran of the United States Army with tours of duty in both Iraq and Afghanistan. He is the recipient of a Purple Heart, and I met him through... Jiu-Jitsu. We are both a member of Straight Blast Gym here in Kalispell, which is an amazing organization. And I met him in person first, and then, of course, as uh, often happens, you meet somebody in person, and then you can kind of start following them on social media or in their electronic realm. And he is vocal in a, in a great way, in an open and humbling and egoless way or has been in the past, and I hope he continues to do so in the future, on his struggles with post-traumatic stress. And one of the posts that he recently put up 
which was a stat that was very difficult to read because I can only imagine um, the weight that it must feel like on an individual's shoulders. But since his separation from the military, he has had uh, 11 friends choose to end their own life. And I think it's a fair assumption to say that those individuals were struggling with or working their way through successfully or not uh, the issues that can arise from military service in a war zone. And Aaron has been pretty vocal about his struggles. And I think that's an amazing thing. I think there's a lot that can be learned and hopefully understood by people who have not experienced those things. And then hopefully if you, for those who are experiencing these types of things or are working their own way through something that is difficult, uh, you can find some strength in hearing somebody else talking about their struggles. Because at the end of the day, I think we're all relatively in the same bucket of water. Uh, we might be in different levels in that bucket of water, but we're all in there together. I know that everybody will find struggles in their life. I certainly do. A lot of the things that he said really resonated with me, and hopefully they resonate with uh, everybody that tunes in. So I'm going to let him do the rest of the talking. Cleared Hot, episode 60 with Aaron Cross. Okay, I got the red smoke. Fire, gun run, north and south, west of the smoke, west of the smoke. Okay, copy, west of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Come on, win it, man. Give it to me. I need it. Get cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. How did you land here in Montana? Are you from Montana? Yeah, well, no, not not originally. Uh, and there, the other backstory is, is uh, uh, I'm actually adopted uh, three years ago. It'll be four years come September um, or uh, um, February, uh, February 23rd, my favorite date. Um, but uh, my family, my dad, my sister, and I moved from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, to Montana in 1990. And we lived. Uh, so you were born in Oklahoma City. Yeah, okay. born in Oklahoma City. Yeah, Okie from Muskogee. Uh, not, not really. But uh, yeah, so uh, lived here. This, this is the place I've called home since 1990, and, and I loved it. Always want to come back. So. Did you? So you enlisted into the army from Montana? Correct. Yep. What was your drive to do that, and when did you do so? Uh, so my original fam family uh, history is we've been militarily uh, involved since 17. 69. I mean, we've been here. Wow. Um, we came off the boat, um, more more so Irish settlers, and we've been involved with every major conflict since since then. Uh, I had family that actually fought on both sides in the Civil War. And it could they, be awkward over Thanksgiving. It was, well, <laughs> actually, what's, what's funny is, is so my great-great-grandfather, uh, he fought for the North, and his mother pretty much like disavowed him from the family. He was like, you will not be a part of this family anymore. Oh, wow. And he was not allowed to be buried into the family plot. Yeah, he's actually buried in South Carolina, which is crazy. Family feuds, they run deep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And well, the, and the, the hilarious thing for me is, you know, Smith, that was my original name, which is why I go by Smitty sometimes, mm -hmm. is that... Uh, it's such a wide range. There, there's such a different history per that lineage of that name. Mm -hmm. Originally, we were Smythe, S-M-Y-T-H-E, and then became Smith. But it's it's really weird because that's more of like the English English part of it. So what do you mean you were adopted? Because you're, I mean, most adoptions I hear of, obviously, you're uh, children. Right. You're, what, you're in your 30s at least. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm in my 40s now. Okay. Uh, I just turned 40 in July. Um, I have never heard of somebody being adopted yeah. uh, in their late 30s, so you're going to have to explain that one. Uh, I had a really horrible childhood as far as uh, abuse goes, and it's physically and mentally, not nothing sexual, thank God. But uh, um, So the parents who I call my folks now, uh, they I had a lot of surrogate fa family when I was going through high school, mm -hmm. and I left home when I was 15. I was like, I had like nowhere to go. I just got tired of it. And so uh, I had some other folks bring me into the fold, and my best friend, who's my brother by adoption now, uh, we were really good friends from the get-go, and he used to take me over to my folks' place back then and go hunting together, shooting together, you know, just, just hang out. And so, uh, like, there was always the joke, like, oh, maybe we should adopt you. And not realizing that after I got out of the military, uh, it was like on a Thanksgiving, and my mom was like, so uh, keep it up. We'll have to adopt you for, for Christmas. And I was like, okay. 
and like the next morning like we just like we kind of like laughed it off like next morning we were just kind of drinking coffee and mom goes you know i wasn't really joking when we wanted to adopt you and i was like well my answer wasn't really joking either and so we got the paperwork together and four months later i was i was adopted wow does yeah. your biological family still live up here as well uh my dad does uh well my biological dad does uh somewhere here in Kalispell and he's kind of a shady character so that sucks man I'm sorry to hear that oh, it is what it is uh the well the the crappy thing about it is is part of my drive of being in the military you know from a really young age like I knew at like six like I knew I was gonna join the military at some facet yeah. and in an early part like I wanted to be a marine and then, my, you, then you wised up Wow, well, I don't know. <laughs> I, it's always it, that, it's always that battle. Thing, I'm joking. I love the Marines. I just you have to take pot shots at them when it's, they come up. It's always that battle. Um, no, I, I got a lot of really good friends who are Marines, and uh, you know, it's it's really funny how they take a lot more pride in in their branch than than sometimes the Army guys do. It's it's kind of funny. I'd say hands down in the U.S. Armed Service that Marines are they're the tightest knit group. Agreed. I was on the plane yesterday flying back from Colorado. And a young Marine was carrying his, um, God, I'll probably mess up the term, but they're, I mean, their uniforms, let's be honest, they're amazing. Their class A's are unbelievable. That white Marine Corps hat with the, uh, what are they, it's like the Eagle and Crest. I believe so, yeah. It, Eagle Globe and, yeah. Yeah. It's an amazing and yeah. an iconic uh, logo. And I was sitting down, and to the left, a person I didn't know, but I came to find out works at the uh, Allied or Applied Science, whatever it is, just up the road, literally, I don't know, 500 yards from here. This Marine's walking by, just graduated from boot camp, and the guy stops him. He's like, oh, when would you graduate? You know, welcome to the Brotherhood. And he had been out and retired for 25 years. It's a, And I've seen that so many times with Marines. And it, at least on the Navy side of the house, I mean, the guy would just be passed out, sonsies, and we also don't have a hat that's like that. But those Marines, man, once a Marine, always a Marine, yeah, for sure. Yeah, they're super tight, super yep. tight. But yeah, so uh, my bi- biological dad is like, well, you'll... I, I'll, I'll never have a son who's a Marine. I was like, okay. And growing up, like, he always had these, like, embellished stories about what he did while he was in the Army. He got drafted. Okay. Was, was in Vietnam. And he was telling me stories like he was a sniper. You know, he was this. He was a tunnel rat. And, you know, he was uh, on Hamburger Hill, which he got a tattoo of a uh, uh, Big Red 1 1st Infantry Division, which 1st Infantry Division wasn't on Hamburger Hill. It was the 101st. Yeah. And oddly enough, my first uh, unit that I was assigned to right out of basic at Airborne School was I went to Fort Campbell. You know, I went to 3rd Brigade 187, which that was the unit that was on Hamburger Hill. Yeah. And so you get, like, really involved with that history and come and, to find out. And it's it like, gives you the ability to do some research. Right. And my first command sergeant major was actually on Hamburger Hill, Command Sergeant Major Brooks. And I just, as a private, like, I didn't know how to approach him, but I asked him just some you know key questions and he goes no i don't i don't ever recall seeing a private smith on on that hill or or anything and i was like interesting yeah and which is kind of it's like a heartbreaker because it's like well you know jo- kind of joining the military was like you know my motivation like make make him proud of me in a sense continue the legacy yeah and so i was kind of doing it for somebody else not for me in a weird sort of way which hindsight being what it is about of been a little wiser um, I don't know. It's just a. It's one of those realizations. It's like maybe you should do stuff for yourself, not for anybody else. You know. Yeah. Were you ever able to run to ground what your dad actually did in the army? He was a pogue. He was a uh, like a like a mail clerk. <laughs> yeah. I laugh only because I've seen that scenario play its out itself out so many times. I just I think the last podcast I just did, somebody was asking me about what to do when you encounter somebody who's lying about their service. Right, yeah, I listened to that. It was really good. So the second one that happened recently happened literally out in the driveway. And it was the same thing. I'm sure if I ran the guy's research to ground, I bet, or ran his career to ground, I bet that he served, but in a capacity that he didn't think was cool enough. And that's the mistake I see people making. Instead of just being proud of their service, right. they have to make it comparative. And then so then they start layering on. And the people that I hear, that as soon as they start going down the round of uh, or the route of you know talking about recognizable operations, and then I was just sniping like, oh god, <laughs> here we go, <laughs> here we go, here we go. But again, like I said in that podcast, I just feed the rope, let them tie their own noose, and then you know you have options once yeah. they have uh, set the noose. Right. Well, it's like a, a buddy of mine. I posted a meme. Uh, I deployed with him in Afghanistan. He posted a meme on Facebook. It said, uh, 
there was a, and, I, and I'm paraphrasing here, but it says something like, uh, there were 200 SEALs that operated during Vietnam. So far, I've met 1,000 of them? Yeah, I've, I've met 1,000 of them. Exact one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. it's pretty bad. Like when the guy told me, how is it SEAL Team 3 in Vietnam? I'm like, oh. Here we go. <laughs> Do your internet research at least, buddy. That didn't get created until the mid-'80s. Right. Yeah. So you knew you wanted to join the military, yep. which is a, a common theme that, uh, that I had as well, and for the people that I was surrounded by. So talk me through your military experience. Uh, so I joined infantry, just a ground pounding grunt, and then uh, actually had a. You did you have that desire joining, or did you have a path that you wanted to go on? No, I I, I definitely wanted to be a grunt. Uh, I mean, I had, you know, I, I actually had some research my family gave me when I was younger, and uh, it's it's kind of funny. Um, like I, there were guys that were grunts, you know, during Civil War. I got to hear some of their stories then when I was a kid from my great great grandfather. And it's like, wow, I mean, it's it's pretty cool lineage. And Can you imagine being a grunt in the Civil War? No, absolutely not. <laughs> no. Um, Let's line up facing each other at three times the distance we can spit and fire away. Right. No thank you. Right. Um, especially like the stories of Gettysburg. Have you, ever, have, you, have you ever been there? I have never been to Gettysburg, but I've heard from people who have been that you can feel the sorrow in the ground yeah. and the loss. Yeah, I, I actually got a really cool tour with, I was actually uh, retired General Grange's aide when we did the, uh, he was a huge uh, ranger legend mm. back in the day, but we got a tour of the place and the guy was telling us, you know, we hit this uh, creek and I can't remember the name of the creek, but they were like, and of course you'd cease fire, you know, when the night came and the guys were literally like having a conversation with each other, north and south, they're having a conversation like... Like they were best friends, and then once the light came on, it was like game on. All right, well we got to do this. Do I mean and you do the research on the number of people who would be lost in a single day, let alone like the Battle of Gettysburg in general, like tens of thousands of people, and that's I don't know. It puts it all in perspective for yeah. sure. I mean, I went to the Vietnam uh, Memorial not too long ago and had a pretty sobering experience of just realizing how lucky I have been. Not that my name would be be on a wall somewhere and then you just look at the totality of that and like okay that's less than one of the battles in the civil war right unbelievable yeah it's crazy so you knew you wanted to be a grunt yep no i wanted to be a grunt i actually had an airborne contract going straight in so i went straight from basic to uh airborne school in fort benning georgia oh i've been yeah you yeah tell me about your experience there how was it for you <laughs> uh well <laughs> sergeant airborne uh, well, the funny thing about it is, so going from basic training back then to, all right, well, it's knife hands, you're going to do it this way, you know, period, to actually having some freedom yeah. in airborne school. It was what like year a, was this? It was 97. Okay. It was a totally different environment for me. So it was like, oh, I, I have freedom. Like, I don't have to stick around here after, you know, 1700. Um, Which is five o'clock, people. Right. Five yeah. O'clock. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but no, to get uh, thrown into a wide, diverse of military, other military personnel, like I, I never thought in my, you know, you know, back then, like I'd run across like Navy personnel or Air Force yep. personnel or Marines. And it was like really funny because I had this uh, Lance Corporal that was in my stick and I called him private and he about lost his mind. And I was like, I, I didn't mean to, you know, I didn't mean to offend you, man. He's like, no, it's Lance Corporal. And I was like, all right, cool, cool, right on. He probably just got that title, so therefore was very sensitive about it. Yeah, yeah. What? When did you join? What day and month? Uh, let's see. It was... Because if you went through Airborne in 97, our path started relatively close. So I joined August 1st of 96. My first day of basic, no kidding, was actually July 4th of 97. Okay. I joined... I did the depth program, I believe, October of 96. Okay. Out of here. When did you start in Benning? That was July of, of uh, 97. For Airborne or Basic? Basic. When did you go to Airborne in Benning? Uh, it was October. I actually graduated... Uh, of 97? Yep. So we were there at almost the same time period. Okay. I graduated August 15th, 97 from BUDS. And oh. I think checked into Airborne before September 1st. Oh, right on. Of 97. So we probably were sharing the same chow hall. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's funny. That's hilarious. So you wanted to be airborne, or yep. you got to airborne. Tell, you you get to explain the airborne experience mm. from somebody who was, in fact, uh, airborne. Uh, it's violent. Uh, <laughs> static line jumping is not, not exactly the most fun thing to do. Uh, it's really, it's not smooth at all. And it's a, it's a violent walkout. It's not really a jump. It's a violent walkout. It's a forceful walkout. Um, 
A forceful opening. Yes. Forceful for- landing. Forceful landing. There's nothing smooth about it whatsoever. No. Nothing. My first jump ever out of an airplane was at Benning, wedged in between probably 40 people. I was like dead center of the stick. And I don't know if I could have stopped if I wanted to, because once that line started moving and the, you know, the instructors just sitting there waving at the static lines, next thing I know, I was out of an airplane and then went, uh, my version of the PLF, which was back of the heels, back of the head. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I might've hit my ass. Maybe, maybe. Um, I yeah. distinctly remember laying there looking up at, cause I, you know, there's plane after plane after plane. So it's just a sky full of canopies. I remember laying there with probably one of the worst headaches of my life. And all I could think of was, I don't know if I can do this four more times, which is the minimum you need to have to graduate. The right. Course. Well, the funny thing about it is, is like, they, you know, they tell you, keep your eyes on the horizon. And I was actually, I actually had that like Nirvana moment there for a second. That first jump, cause it was during the day. It yep. was gorgeous, nice and sunny, you know? And it was like, ah, and all of a sudden like the ground was there. I was like, Oh crap. Like yep. I didn't have, I really didn't have time to like slip and like, no, nah. like it was definitely my fault for sure. But I could just hear like the airborne instructor on the bottom, like in their, in the, uh, the phone like slip away airborne you know <laughs> just just yelling at you the whole time and it was like oh okay. and you have to, we have to describe this scene because i also as i was laying there so there's a huge for people listening you probably have no idea what we're talking about there's a massive massive grass field that's the drop zone and the school like the entire school jumps at once and there's got to be hundreds of students oh easy and there is an individual on the drop zone with the biggest set of speakers you've ever seen and he's yelling into the microphone at people who are in the air with no way at all to really highlight the individual that he is talking to. So I was laying on my back and I hear him go, jumper with the streamer, cut, you know, pull your reserve. And I just watch dun, 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 dun. all these reserves came out because nobody knew who he was talking to. No, it, it's like, it's like trying to herd a bunch of cats with, with parachutes on. It's, it's, it's hilarious. It's amazing that more people don't die there looking back at it. Well, recently, uh, Fort Bragg has had a, a slew of incidents within the past few years. Have they really? Yeah, with the new new parachute designs, they've been having issues left and right, which is pretty sad. It's not the safest activity, for no, sure. No, And, you know, everybody always asks me, like, well, how, many, how many jumps do you do? And I'm like, well, nothing that count. Yeah. And they're like, well, what do you mean? I was like, well, I ran across a gentleman uh, in Eureka who actually did all five jumps of World War II. Like, combat jumps. Yeah, that's awesome. That's that's hardcore like that dude is has all the respect i you know and he's like well how many how many jumps you do i was like i have i can't touch that like, yeah i practiced a bunch yeah but yeah yeah so uh so you went basic you went to uh, airborne and then talk me through the rest of your uh, military experience i got orders cut to go to fort uh, fort campbell kentucky and from there i went to third brigade 101st uh 187 which has a really long history in the airborne community uh break that i mean actually coming from the navy so Third Brigade, hundred and first, one eight seven. Break that down for me, because I don't even necessarily know how that fits into everything. So a division has uh, brigade sets, and I'm not sure how many brigades they have now per. But I remember there is at least three brigades per division. Now, now that's not including like support units and mm-hmm. all that stuff. We're just talking like infantry brigades, and each brigade has four companies. Back then, it was like five companies. Uh, they had an Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta. And back then it was like a headquarters where they called it like Echo Company. Mm-hmm. Um, and like your Delta in the 90s was like your, um, um, how can I say this, your mechanized unit back then. So like your heavy Humvee groups. Like artillery and stuff as well or not? So, some artillery depending on what uh, unit you're in. But like in uh, 101st they had like uh, Dragon teams that was attached to that. So they had like you know, dragon elements on top of their Humvees and stuff okay. like that. So, and then you had, uh, so those companies attached, and then you had uh, four platoons, or actually five platoons, no, no, four platoons in each company, which you had uh, first, second, third, and then you had a headquarters platoon, which is typically like your mortars, and then you're like your support units of the of the company. And okay. That's how it works. And then one, the 187 associated with the 101st, how does that tie in? Ooh man, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get murdered for this. Uh, <laughs> it's it's been a bit, it's so been, it's okay it's, not to remember it all. Because um, like in the Navy, it's easy. I'm like you're a SEAL, and this is the team I'm at. There's no there is I guess internally in that bureaucracy a bunch of stuff, but it's pretty easy to identify where people are. Whereas a lot of the time with the Marine Corps and Army units, I get lost in the division brigade. Like it gets tough for me. Yeah, well, 101st is actually the first unit to jump in World War Two. 
Okay. Like they were actually the first airborne unit. That's the reason why they still carry the airborne 101st Airborne. Yep. Even though they're no longer airborne, except for like your Pathfinders and your LURS uh, teams that are there, yep. or LURP. I'm not even sure what they. I think it's LURP, the Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol. Yeah, they just keep changing the designation every time, but. Um, but yeah, they were the first ones to actually jump in World War II, and so that's where their lineage comes from. They're very proud of that. Yeah. And uh, 187, um, back then, uh, prior to that, I think they were actually the 504th, technically. I'm probably getting murdered for this, or the 506th. No, I think they were attached to the 506th under that brand, and then they changed off. And where they got their, their kind of key marker was in Korea. They actually jumped to Korea, and then they were given the name Rakasan, which means uh, falling down umbrella. It's about what a static land parachute is. Right. So at a broad level, um, if you told somebody you were in the 101st, that's a broad description of where you were. Because I think people would recognize the 101st, but the, as you get deeper into that, they're going to be like, Phew. Yeah. Uh, Rakasans have been more, uh, more of a profound name anymore anytime they say nobody ever says like third brigade 187 they'll say like rockasan hmm. um and the reason for it is is uh, colonel Steele, who was actually the uh um company commander during um mogadishu for the rangers yep. he was there mm-hmm. so he gives his like kind of proud moment over that you know kind of deal i get it yeah makes sense so a lot of guys that deployed with with him during iraq they 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 have a really long history. They're actually the uh, first unit to deploy from the 101st to Iraq in 03. Is that where you were at 9-11? You were attached to the 101st? No, it's funny. Um, I was in from 97, and I got out May of 01. Okay. And back then, I had a lot of uh, ego, let's just, let's just say. Yeah, as all males do right. from one degree to another. Well, they had like a Kosovo was kind of going off of that at that time frame, and I was kind of like at that short term while well, your enlistment contract's coming up to an end. Mm-hmm. And I had been asking around to see if I could attach to, um, I can't remember if it was 327 101st that went, or the 506, I can't remember exactly which one. Um, I probably got that wrong too. Um, But uh, they went, and I was like, well, is there any way that I could go there? I was like, I didn't do all this training just to... But you were out now at this point? Not not yet. Oh, okay. Uh, Coastal was still kind of going on. Oh, I'm sorry, yep. And... uh, they were like, well, we can't guarantee you're going to get attached to that unit. And I was like, well, you know what? I'm done. And so uh, May 11th is when I started my terminal terminal leave. And June 18th or June 10th of that same year is when my ETS date was mm-hmm. officially done. And, uh, of Which course, means end of service. End of service, yeah. And then I was a heavy drinker at that point. And my brother, my now brother and I, we were kind of BSing. Uh, on September 10th that night and drink into the early morning of September 11th and we were talking about military tactics and of course you know me being as young as I am I thought I knew everything (laughs) it's it's amazing how like young guys think they just know all sorts of military tactics and they've only been in for like a few years but anyway seconds yeah they know just enough to kill themselves and everybody else around them. exactly and my brother woke me up like he was watching the news and he was like he woke me up and I'll sleep on the couch and the living room and I was like is this is this a movie this can't be real like I said I was still drunk and I was like what what what's going on here yeah and of course my mom at the time she's like are you gonna get called up and I was like I don't know what you're talking about like I sat there like staring at the tv for a good hour going I don't I don't believe what's going on well in that headspace it's tough to parse together reality sometimes yeah well I I quickly I quickly sobered up but it was like what this this can't be real yeah and so uh once that happened uh, I called up a few buddies. Uh, Candelario was actually, a, uh, he's, he just retired. But I actually called him up, and I was like, dude, I was like, is there any way that I could, you know, come back? And he was like, oh, well, I'm not in charge. I was like, well, get a hold of the first sergeant, get a hold of the commander, get a hold of somebody. I said, I'd love to, like, come back and, you know, join the unit. And of course, you can't just, it's not like a Delta Force movie where you just, like, yeah. jump out of civilian clothes and jump. You get dropped off in a four-door Jeep with no drawers, and you got a 501s on and a... A, a t-shirt and the next thing you know you're getting your body armor on it doesn't work like no, that no no with uh, rockets on your motorcycle yeah it just doesn't doesn't work that, like that that's like a that nice all. pairing actually yeah right often seen rarely talked about right <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah um, so first thing I did obviously is I, I went to a recruiter uh, that week and I was like hey can I can I get back in and of course at that time in the 90s uh, the military was at practically full capacity yeah they were downsizing weren't they yeah they were actually cutting people and they were like well like oh, you can come back in, but uh, as an E three, and I got out as an E five, yeah, sergeant. And I was like, well, my pride kicked in. I was like, forget that. 
hindsight being what it is, if I went back in, they'd have probably just promoted me to E5, probably. Or, yeah, your first you know, duty station probably would have reversed it. Yeah. Um, but I was like, no, nah, no, nah, nah, I'm, I'm good. And so I went through, like, this whole bucket of red tape trying to get back in and keep my five. And in the meantime, I actually got a job crabbing up at Alaska for a couple seasons. I did huh. a, a Pelio, and then I did a, well, actually, King Crab, and then I did a, a Pelio. Like the deadliest catch type stuff? Yep, yep. Is this, it as gnarly as it looks like on the Discovery Show? Uh, not as dramatic, but yes, it is gnarly. Okay. Yeah. Probably one of the toughest things I've ever done, for sure. It looks it, even though, obviously, they, I mean, they're adding some of the dramatic effect. It looks like a job that uh, you're going to earn your paycheck. Yeah, and you do. You definitely do. There are some sleepless nights, because you'll work. Just through the clock? Just through the clock. And the funny thing about it is, with, with the... Uh, the nighttime kind of being more pr- uh, prominent during those those months, it, it just feels like your day goes forever. Yeah. And then like the sun will come up, come back down. He's like, oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Am I supposed to sleep now? I don't get it. So. So how long did it take you to actually get back in? Uh, I came back in in '04. Um, wow. June of '04. Uh, I got to come back in. I went under the uh, the 18 X-ray program, which I VW out of because I was married at the time. And I allowed my wife to make my decisions for me. Yep. If I would have been smarter, I would have stayed in uh, with that program. But my heart wasn't into it. I was getting my, my marriage was more focused at, yep. you know, at that point in time than anything else. Uh, lo and behold, uh, she was cheating on me. So uh, I VW'd uh, from SWIC. I was there for two months, two, two and a half months. Uh, I was there with Tim Kennedy, mm-hmm. uh, hardcore dude. We used to get our ball smoked off. Uh, PT twice a day, and he'd still go to the gym after. I mean, yep. the guy's just a phenomenal piece. He's a cool dude. Hopefully, I'm going to have him on one day. Cool. But, uh, yeah, I wound up going down to uh, 82nd Land, which is what the SF guys call 82nd Land. Go go, go to the lesser beings. <laughs> and so I went down the street and uh, went through this nasty divorce. And while I was going through this divorce, I actually got deployed in my first deployment to Afghanistan in 05 okay. with the uh, first uh, 325th uh, Airborne of True Regiment. Where'd they send you to? Went to Ghazni. We probably shared the uh, the same sandbox from time to time then as well, because back in 05, we were bouncing back and forth. We'd go to Iraq, we'd come back to Afghanistan. Right. I don't. We would always base, though, out of, uh, generally out of like Bagram mm-hmm. or some of the little outstations, but we would just, I mean, we get in the 47s, and honestly, half the time, I don't know where we were going. I would just follow the map that was in my football sleeve. Yeah. <laughs> I actually kind of like Bagram. It, was, it seemed a little bit more low-key than Kandahar. Kandahar, the last time I was there, there was a Hertz rental car. Yep. There was a Timmy Horton's coffee. I want to say Applebee's, but it might have been one of the other brands. No, no. It was an Applebee's. Yeah. that's And then to me, that's probably the sign that maybe we've been there too long, and yeah. people's heads are in the wrong place. Exactly. Yeah. Totally yeah. concur. So you went over there, and then... Uh, Talk me through the rest of your career until when you actually got out. Uh, let's see. So deployed, and of course, I uh, got back uh, November of 05 with those guys. And I was going through, just got divorced that same month. And so the only thing I wanted to do was deploy more. You know, you just mm-hmm. want to keep chasing deployments. And so a third... It allows you to push the reality of your personal life off. Right. And 3rd Brigade 82nd, which is the 505th uh, Parachute Infantry Regiment, um, they were asking for volunteers to go to Iraq. And, of course, I raised my hand, and seven months later, I was gone again. Mm-hmm. And this time around, it was for 15 months. And and so for people listening, too, like, in the world I came from, traditionally, you'd have at least 18 months off if you were at a conventional team, and then six to eight. So you were accelerating the normal train or decompression, retrain, deploy. And you were over there for, that's a long, that's a long stint. Yeah, and I didn't tell my folks that I was deploying for, like, four months. Because they're like, oh, you're back home. And I, I did go home. Yeah. I uh, went on leave. And, uh, to here. Yeah. Yep. I came back home here. And next thing I know, I'm, I'm deployed again. And I didn't tell them. And for like four months. And my company commander came knocking on my, my chew door in uh, uh, Fob Summerall. And he was like, call home now. And I was like, is this an emergency? He goes, for you it is. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and of course, I got my, my butt chewed for a good like a half hour on the phone from mom. Um, so ever since then, I definitely kept her in the loop as far as like what was going on. Um, but yeah, 15 months. Uh, uh, initially, it was actually 12 months with a three-month extension. And what year and location was this? It was uh, Beji primarily. Mm-hmm. So the Beji Oil Refinery was our company's main domain. Uh, and my platoon got detached twice to go help uh, 3rd Brigade's 2nd Battalion in, um, doggone it, 
Turkey Bowl to I can't remember exactly 30th to Moose is where it was called and then we went to um, Diala province uh, towards the end of our deployment and so this was now 07, 08? Yep, uh, from 06 to 07. Yep. Which was a very highly kinetic time period. Over yeah, there. it was definitely Cowboys and Aliens for sure. It was, yep. it was The rules of engagement were a lot less strict. Yeah. So it was what we'd call good times. <laughs> yeah, target-rich environment, if you will. Yeah, a lot of door kicking. Yep. And yeah. So what was, your, what was your primary mission set while you guys were over there during that time period? Uh, we were so... We were attached to 2nd Infantry, Infantry Division's battle space in Bakuba for in the Diala province towards the end. And my platoon was actually the spearhead of going into the city. We had, we had locked it down, and we were actually the spearhead of going in and kind of clearing out the town. Yeah. And by that, I'm assuming you mean street-level door-to-door. Yep, street-level door-to-door. Uh, we called in a lot of uh, Danger Close uh, JDAMs. Yep. Uh, there's a video. My uh, favorite term, in yep. case you haven't figured it out from the name of the podcast. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there's actually a, a video on YouTube called, uh, I think it's Hammer Diallo. One of our one of our guys actually posted a video on it just collectively of, of our deployment. And we actually dropped a JDAM, called in closer, close on air support, uh, from literally like right across the street. And it knocked in every window of the building that we were in calling calling fire from like yeah. it was that close it'll do that yeah if you're that close yeah so yeah it was it was pretty fun but uh no our, our primary objective when we got there was the basic oil refinery so like setting up security getting every kind of everything kind of placed in and working with the uh iraqi police and the iraqi army at that time which we were still build, building up brand new chevys you know 1500s were showing up mm-hmm. brand new you know nine millimeter pistols the whole works it seems like it was probably really in the buildup of the counterinsurgency strategy right. where you're going to live among. And counterinsurgency, I don't even think we have time to unpack that, but let's just say it's a long, drawn-out process that starts with you have to create a secure environment and then gain the trust of the people, which means you're living in and among them. Or I would say in your guys' role, probably owning the battle space. Yep. 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 Yeah, we definitely owned it for sure because um, we live on station for, I think, uh, four to five days at a time. Then we get... You know, we get replaced. Yeah. Go back, refit, and then we go off and do like another mission, or be QRF or yeah. what have you. It's. I mean, it's always fascinating for me to talk to people from that world because it's the exact opposite of right. what. I mean, we used to. I'd hear about it from people, like, yeah, we hated you guys because we are living in this battle space, and these helicopters would show up, and all hell would break loose, and then you would leave, and they would come to us to try to, you know determine what had happened and the repercussions that were going to come from it. Well, we had an SF team on FOB uh, Summerall. They were actually a uh, uh, 20th group, and I can't remember exactly where they were from, but they had better intel than our own brigade did. And so a buddy of mine and I, Duff, Duff Field, a really good buddy of mine, uh, still talk to him today. We'd actually go knock on their compound door, like, hey, man, could you uh, hook us up some, like, yeah. uh, like to-date imagery? Because we'd show up on, you know, our objective location and be like, well, that building wasn't what is, what is that doing there? Oh, you're using a six-year-old sal- yeah. salad image? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it would just drive us nuts. Yeah, I don't know if people realize inherently the difference in not only capability, but the support at various levels throughout the military. It's not, there's no uh, shared internet portal that everybody taps into. It's mm-hmm. a lot of, at least early on too, it was a lot of individual rice bowling. And I think, and I hope that that's still, they're doing a good job of breaking that down. Because, I mean, we, <laughs> I remember we were in... Before Iraq kicked off, we were in Saudi Arabia waiting. And our guy, we, we had a 24th uh, PJ attached to us, this PJ and CCT. He would go to their intel dudes, and they were getting the intel of like what was actually going on. So we were, same thing, going outside of our chain of command to try to figure out, like, is this is this happening or what's going on? Yeah, here? yeah. That's insane. It's insane. Yeah. Um, so got back from deployment from Iraq. And during that deployment, I had some friendly fire, uh, a 203 grenade shrapnel hit me in the right leg. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get a really cool job at Fort Leavenworth, uh, Kansas, as a uh, trainer. Mm-hmm. Uh, what we did was we trained a battalion and brigade uh, talk operations and talk op drills, which was pretty cool. And I did that as an E6 staff sergeant. And by talk, you mean tactical operations center? Yep. Think of that for people listening as the... 
This is probably what you would see in the movies where there's all these TV screens around and people planning. I mean, essentially, it's not like that in real life, but if you've ever seen this big planning area in the movies with all the TVs and the live satellite images, which don't exist, but I digress, that's what you're seeing. That's the talk. Yep, and uh, what we do is we trained uh, the, the battalion staffs who, who do all the planning for their, their units, you know, how they operate and do, you know, conduct, you know, push out certain mission sets to, mm-hmm. you know, their companies and, and whatever. Um, so we would actually train those staffs on how to do that. And so, I'm not going to lie, I mean, that gave me my E7. That made me look really good on paper. Yeah. So. Well, it probably rounded you out really well as a soldier as well. Oh, for sure. It gave me, like, a huge scope it, of, you know, what, your, what the Army does. It brings your vision from your front sights. Yep. To actually what gets you into position to use your front sights. Those administrative roles, they force it for the officers in the SEAL community, the joint roles and detached roles and people hate it because they want to like oh i want to go be down where you know things that are exciting are happening but they come back with a better understanding of how the machine works so they can make the sausage better exactly yeah it's it's kind of funny because my platoon sergeant when i was in iraq he would give you know a squad leader be like hey you get to plan the mission off of the platoon and we'll kind of the lt and i will oversee it mm-hmm. and then we'll kind of go and go from there and so um it's kind of crazy how you're like well this is stupid why are we doing this and then you look back That's at it. That's the classic it. E5 comment for everything. Yeah, yeah. Or even SB6. <laughs> it's like, why, why, am I, why am I doing this? And so you can kind of pull back a little bit. And you get to see a wide range of why you're doing it. It's like, ah, okay, well, that makes sense. Maybe yeah. I shouldn't be so critical next time. Um, so I did that job. I was at Fort, Fort Livermore for uh, three years. And as soon as my leg healed up and kind of rehabbed on my own, started like running on my own, rucking mm-hmm. on my own. How bad was your injury? Uh, it wasn't really debil- debilitating. Uh, but I wound up getting the shrapnel taken out in 2010. It was kind of harping on my uh, peroneal nerve. Yep. And so I, I wasn't able to run a whole lot. And um, as soon as I kind of got healed up and was able to start kind of running again, uh, first thing I did was, what's the first duty station I could go to? Which one's closer to home? And which one is deploying? And that's what I did. And so we did a uh, kind of like a staff meeting with uh, Second Brigade, uh, second ID infantry division out of uh, Fort Lewis for Joint Base Lewis mm-hmm. McCord, and I talked to the brigade sergeant major, and I was like, "Do you have any uh, platoon sergeant sl- slots open?" And he goes, "Yeah." I was like, "Sweet." I was like, "Put me on the first one if you don't mind." And I got pinpoint orders, which rarely happens. Uh, and I showed up at reception, and the uh, he was actually the first sergeant of Charlie Company in the same. Uh, battalion f- first follow fifth. Uh, I was in Bravo Company first follow fifth. He was the first sergeant of Charlie Company during our deployment in Iraq, and he showed up at reception and he goes, "What battalion are you going to?" I said, "Not in those Sergeant Major, in the Sergeant Major Green." And he was like, uh, "You're going to my battalion." Yeah, I was gonna say his response was, "I do probably." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so he he knew of me. We'd worked, you know, we'd done joint operations with the you know in, within the battalion. So he knew of me, and. Uh, and so I we deployed to Afghanistan, uh, to April 2012, to uh, January 2013 when I was a platoon sergeant uh, for that deployment. Yep. And then we were in uh, Argandab province. Okay. And then after that deployment, uh, during that deployment to be uh, November 9th, uh, 2012, uh, my striker vehicle uh, got hit by a double stack AT mine, uh, which. Uh, Strikers are V-hold, right? Uh, they are now. Yeah, okay. they didn't used to be. Which Was the one you were in V-hold? Yes, thank okay. God. Which is why you survived. Yep. Uh, it destroyed the whole undercarriage on my side of the striker, which there's, uh, you have a, a leader's hatch and a TC, which is the truck commander. Yep. Uh, he was a E4, really cool dude. We call each other Blast Brothers, because that's just how it is. Yep. Uh, but both he and I were standing. And where they hit was actually between me and the driver, which in there they call it the hell hole. Mm-hmm. And the reason for it is because there's a lot of deaths that actually happen in that, that spot when IEDs go off. And they knew exactly where to hit because that's exactly where it exploded. Do you know if it was command initiated or pressure plate? You know, it's funny because we had a uh, mine roller with a vehicle. I think it was an MRAB and I can't. I can't remember the nomenclature of the vehicle for whatever reason. Yeah. But we had a mine roller in front of that. Yep. And he was in front of me. And he went right over that same area, no issues. I went over it and boom. So probably command initiated. Yeah. So uh, knock us, knocked us out, all of us out for quite a while. And um, 
yeah, that was kind of like the the culminating event of my military career because my, my back was shot at that point. Is that the instant that you received your Purple Heart from? Yep. Okay. It is. And uh, me and my guys, there were three of us that got hit the hardest. It was the driver, me, and uh, uh, Timothy Rankin, my TC. We got hit the hardest, and we got sent to the Roll 3 on uh, Kandahar. For, we were there for a good month, month and a half. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of rehab and all that stuff. Yeah. And, and then I wound up just being the uh, battalion liaison um, for our unit, uh, in touch with the uh, brigade for the rest of deployment. So I, 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 I kind of lost my platoon at that point in time, Yeah, which is understandable. I mean, I, I totally get it. I mean, I can't operate, so yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, they threw you in an administrative role. Yeah, and so I helped the uh, battalion kind of get their ducks in a row and get guys you know, redeployed back here to the States uh, in January. Then I was on the last uh, lift home. And then how long until you, uh, after that, did you separate from the military? Uh, it was a year and a half. Yeah. Um, I got out uh, June uh, 2014. What type of uh, departure did you have? Were you medically retired? Did you just no, get I, out? I just got medical out. I didn't get medical retired. I okay. got medical out. So they gave me a severance. And it, By that, you mean like a one-time payment? Yep. I'm assuming it probably wasn't substantial. It wasn't bad. I'm not okay. going to lie. Good. All right. I, um, did you have, was it a planned departure or it just you physically were unable to do the job? I was physically unable to be a grunt anymore. And so the okay. Army was like, you know, you, you can't you can't do your job as a, as a grunt, you know, and there really is no rehab for lower back stuff. And so um, they did... They did kind of give me a choice. Um, I did have an opportunity to be uh, part of the infantry branch down in Fort Benning, Georgia, but that's where I would have stayed for the mm-hmm. rest of my military career. And I was like, you know, for one, I'm not a big fan of Fort Benning itself. There's a lot of good hunting there. Yeah. But uh, as far as like Fort Benning itself, I'm like, eh, not, not really my, my jam. I said, I'd rather just go home. I mean, and that's what I did. How long did you have when you were in um, to prepare for your exit from the military? Did, could you see it coming from a pretty good distance away, or was it relatively rapid? Um, it was fast-paced. Um, I think it was, I want to say May, June of 2013, that the PA, battalion PA, was like, there really isn't, really isn't a whole lot of choices for you. He's like, we could just start doing like a medical for you and just you know, give it your best shot for going through the board. And I was like, yeah, let's, let's do it. I mean, because I... Is what it is. I mean, there is no surgery process for the lower, lower back stuff. Yeah. And so there really wasn't a whole lot of options. And um, it was it was pretty fast paced. Usually it takes you know anywhere from a year to year and a half for that process to go through. And I had orders from the moment it started. I think it was within like nine, ten months. And then I had orders to be ETS. Separation orders. Yep. What'd you do in that time period, that nine months to prep for getting out? I was the battalion NCO for our battalion, and there wasn't a whole lot of time for me to kind of get away and, and prep yep. for the outside outside world process. Um, I helped write the battalion of the brigade uh, talk SOP and tactical operations SOP because uh, they knew that I had that experience from being in uh, Fort Leavenworth, mm-hmm. and so they just kind of like threw me into that, that role and said, take charge. So, I mean, I, I didn't really take charge for the brigade, but I took charge for the battalion and helped write it up. So how was your departure? How would you describe um, separation from the military? Um, it was hard. Um, and the reason for it is because, I mean, I, I had just re-enlisted indefinitely during my deployment in Afghanistan, my last deployment. And so, like, my mind was already set, like, I'm going to stay in for the long haul. And to have that happen to me, it was like my whole world just kind of, like, just started crushing, you know, crashing down on me. And so I, I never had any kind of like preparation to be like, what am I going to do now? Like, which is the common narrative I would say for almost everybody in the military. Yeah. They and focus, they wanted to join the military. So they focus their energy on thinking about that. Then they're in the military. They're focusing their energy thinking about that. And then they look at a calendar and they go, uh Oh, mm-hmm. I'm done in six months. Yep. And you're behind the power curve to say the least. Yeah. And, of course, you know, when I came back in the military, the only thing I wanted to do was deploy. Mm-hmm. I mean, 9-11 was kind of like my my heart and soul of coming back in the military. So all I wanted to do was deploy. And it wasn't a matter of, like, shooting people in the face or anything like that. It was just a matter of, especially after my first deployment, you get to see a lot of these, you know, you get to see a lot of um, uh, local nationals, you know, village people that really are oppressed. I mean, by to outside. a degree that people would not use that word in this country if they had that um, 
context, right? And they could have they could look at the contrast between the two and how they're describing their oppression. And I'm not saying that there aren't people who aren't oppressed here, but I'm just saying once you've seen that, what you're talking about, and people bitching about how their latte wasn't hard enough, that's not oppression, right? Uh, no, a, a good a good uh, example of that is we were uh, I had a school that was in my area, my last uh, deployment in Afghanistan uh, in the Argonaut province that the school was shut down because the Taliban was threatening the parents. Mm-hmm. Like, do not send your kids to school. We will kill you. And that's 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 oppression. It is. And then you got to look at that generationally, too, because education, you know, I'm, not, I'm no expert at this, but you look at people who are experts, and they say, you know, education is the ladder to get yourself out of poverty and the oppression if you can. And you remove that. Yeah. And, yeah, they just have, they have you held down with their thumb. Mm-hmm. And it's terrible to watch. I mean, some of the... Most the things that probably stick with me the most are some of the things that I would see the local nationals doing to themselves, or the their own country, the Taliban, which is homegrown. If we're talking about Afghanistan, doing to their own people. I mean, that's it's the treatment that I saw, far and away exceeds some of the uh, very brutal things that you'll see yeah. in war. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's a. Uh, it was definitely. A- an eye-opening experience and once I got my first kind of taste of that my first point in 05 it was like this is different this isn't what I thought it was going to be it's not like in the movies there is no tick tick parade there is no clear definition of good guy bad guy Mm -hmm. it's a lot more complex than that so that's that's a lot that's that's a really broad picture I mean it's there is no really clear it's gray yeah people love to talk in terms of black and white because I think it inherently makes them feel more comfortable because it's it's you know it's precise and it's very clear and i don't even know if gray is the right color for uh the overseas environment it's, it's just i would say it's more the absence of black or white I, uh, I would i would definitely characterize it as a murky pond yeah the absence of maybe any color yep it's yeah it's tough and again i i don't wish that experience on people but i wish that context so they could view the world slightly differently because it certainly would i think I think in this country it would calm people the hell down. Oh, absolutely, uh, and very. It would give everybody kind of like a clear context of what it means to actually survive and appreciate things a lot better. Yeah, I agree. Uh, what was the first job you took when you got out? <laughs> I'm assuming you came back to Kalispell. I, no, I came. I, uh, my home is in uh, Eureka, okay. uh, just which is just north of here, uh, by by about an hour. Is that the one just by the Canadian border? Yep. Okay. Yep. It's eight hours from the Canadian border. And, uh, of course, knowing that I was going to go back home, I, I knew that jobs there were slim to none. Uh, and so I, I initially picked up my, my old job, kind of sad, of, of working the bowling alley uh, when I was in high school. And it was like, man, I did that for like three weeks. And I was like, I'm, I can't do this anymore. I, I'm, I'm way <laughs> past this. And, uh, and so I started just kind of throwing resumes out there. Mm-hmm. And, and I didn't really have a whole lot of expertise writing a resume. And so it was more like clear cut of what my job descriptions were, you know, and what I've done versus kind of not really embellishing, but more expanding that that knowledge base of what your job entitles. The creative writing aspect exactly. of the resume. Yeah. And so I wasn't really getting a whole lot of hits and I was getting very disgruntled. I'll yeah. be honest. I was very disgruntled and I was kind of having that uh, kind of like that entitlement sense yep. of personality, like why am I not getting this? I deserve this. Um, when in fact I really didn't deserve it like you have to earn it yep. and I, it came to a really long battle for me uh, so I, I struggled for about two years and a buddy of mine uh, Duff who I mentioned earlier lives in uh, North Carolina and he was still in the army at Fort Bragg uh, with the uh, civil affairs and he was like hey man he's like uh, I'm sure we can get a job for you here somewhere I was like alright sounds good military community Mm-hmm. Kind of like, you know, be back in my own. Back into the fold of what you know and you're comfortable with. Stopping grounds, you know, people I, you know, I'm comfortable with. And I struggled there for a year throwing out resumes. And I almost went like the private contracting route just because I just had enough. And I was like, I'll just give it a shot. Why not? Well, and it's an easy way to fill the cash register too. Yeah, it is. Um, but uh, I wind up kind of just giving that up too. I want to move in a bit. I moved back home uh, to see be what year is it? I'd say it's 18. 2018. For a few more months. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so moved back home in April 2017. And I had resumes already filled out before I even came home. You barely beat us here. We moved here uh, July 1st, 2017. Oh, cool. Yeah. And 
I wound up getting a job right off the bat with uh, Flathead Brewing Company. Okay. I worked that job for like two days. Yep. Because I had a job coming up with uh, Grizzly Security, which is kind of like more my realm. I was like, sweet, I like this job. And it was working at the KMRC at the hospital. Yep. And where you pretty much like lived and breathed in the emergency room, dealing with all kinds of uh, colorful characters in the Flathead Valley. Um, I think all valleys and places have colorful characters, but depending on your job, you might interact with them more than others. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. And uh, during that job time frame, I think within about three weeks, uh, a job service actually contacted me and said, hey, uh, Falkor Defense is looking for people like your skill set. And I was like, sweet, awesome. And so I went in for an interview and I and, uh, got that job instead, which paid a little bit more and gave me a little, little bit more leeway. And... Um, Man, I'm I'm actually liking life now. I mean, life is good, uh, and it was definitely one of those jobs. You know, starting from the gate where uh, I started doing like aerospace assembly, mm-hmm. uh, and they realized that hey, this guy likes to work, and I appreciated that job more than anything because they gave me a chance, gave me an opportunity, mm-hmm. and being unemployed for three years, hey, it's you're a, hungry. It's a tough realization. Yeah, and. Uh, not able to really talk about what I do. I mean, I could I kind of describe it, but I can't really tell you exactly what parts I make, what anything yeah. like that. It kind of gives it a little bit of a anonymity, which I is kind of cool in a weird sort of way. Yeah. And so I can kind of pat myself on the back, like, hey, I built this. I saw it on the news. It's kind of cool. Um, so uh, going from there, they've uh, promoted me and gave me the Dracos managing position, which I do with the barrels. Yep. And uh, I was actually to be able to. I was actually on a podcast with you uh, a few days ago, which is like my first, which is pretty cool. Yep. And they're going to start ship, shipping me to the range to do a bit more testing on the rifle builds and stuff like that because of my experience in dealing with stuff Where do overseas. they test their rifles? You know, I don't know. I Is think there a good long-range uh, rifle place out here? Uh, I'm not going to test that because I don't know. I'll yeah. have to do more. I mean, I'm sure you could drive out into the hills. I'm not sure the legalities of that, but okay. <laughs> I don't know if there's anybody out there to bust you. <laughs> well, you know, in Eureka, I mean, we'd, we'd shoot across the reservoir back in the day. This is back in the high school days. Yeah. Back in the days when you could actually have a rifle in the back of your you know, in your window of your truck yeah. parked at high school, you know, and it was no big deal. Now you can't do that. So. I wouldn't recommend doing that no. in the modern day. No. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So, um, physically, like it was, I mean, it seems like that you were working your way through it, getting out of the military. How were you between the ears when you were getting out? Chaos. Uh, and I didn't realize it until uh, recently that uh, the chickens had come home to roost. And by that, so uh, prior to our deployment, my last deployment to Afghanistan, uh, the unit went to the National Training Center in uh, California. And I didn't realize that I was having issues then. Like, I just didn't, I didn't know that. But uh, we were in this scenario where we had to go into the town and uh, we had to get in a firefight. And of course, mm-hmm. it's with blank ammunition, you know, blank adapters, the whole works, nothing real. And they actually had contractors there that were missing, li- you know, yeah, limbs. role players, role Either players, local nationals or amputees. Yep. yep, it's very, very realistic. Very realistic. Uh, the only thing that's kind of missing is the the smell, which is it's almost there, but not, yep. not not the same. And we had to extract this, uh, you know, this this guy out, and things like I we had to do like an after action review, and I was like, I, I I need a few minutes. Like I I seriously need a few minutes, and I didn't realize it. Then like hey like you need to go see somebody you need to talk to somebody about this and I was like no nah, no nah, I'm good but like, I'm telling myself like ego check you know pride mm-hmm. I, got, I got this in the bag I don't what were you experiencing personally is it was it uh, like anxiety was it self doubt uh, it was anxiety for sure uh, self doubt no um, because I mean I I haven't been in a whole lot of firefights but I've been in a few firefights where I'm like well I'm, I know that my my guys left and right I'm not gonna I'm not gonna let those guys down yeah. Um, I'm gonna do whatever I can to get my boys back home safe and sound. And I told my guys, my platoon, that uh, the first day, uh, introducing myself, like, "Hey, I, I can't give you any promises, and I'm not I'm not gonna promise you shit. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be hard on you as much as I can to prepare you for those that have never been deployed. Mm-hmm. And I'm gonna do whatever I can to make the best decisions for you to come home safe. And that's all I care about. I don't care about anything else. I don't care about medals. I don't care about accolades. I don't care about getting pat on the back. I was like, as long as I can bring every single one of you back home, that's my main mission." And that's just how I looked at it. And so, yeah, a lot of anxiety during that time. Uh, and it it was like in and out. Like it hit me, and it was like, okay, back to training. It's no big deal. And that's kind of how everybody deals with that, 
you know, in that in that infantry environment. Because you get back from deployments, you do this like uh, computerized check the block. Like, have you experienced this? Have you experienced that? And the big thing in it's your back of your mind, it's the self-reporting questionnaire. Yeah, we had to do this too. And the biggest thing in the back of your mind, well, I, I want to keep deploying, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna check that box. I'm good. I, I don't I don't need help in this area. Yeah. And so, in hindsight, being what it is, I, I think it should have been key that at least a uh, next level leader, which call what you will, um, overlooks your shoulder, said, "Yeah, you did experience that. You need to like check that block," because bottom line is, if you're if you're having issues, you need to get checked out. You need to get fixed. Would you say it was a fair, uh, or it is a fair characterization that you were dealing with post traumatic stress? issues when you were having those uh that anxiety at like in that tra training environment oh yeah absolutely because i don't i mean I, people describe it in different ways and i don't want to uh label it for you um but I, I picked that term because it's common in the military how was your unit were they doing anything proactive were they reaching out and providing or creating resources guys that maybe vocally or quietly which are the ones you and i have talked about the ones that worry me are the quieter ones that don't say anything and then you're like you get a terrible text at two o'clock in the morning how was your what was the environment in the units that you were in as your career progressed when it came to post-traumatic stress that that's never brought up like you don't hear that term while you're serving like nobody says oh you got ptsd you need to go see somebody yeah the only time someone goes to see sees mental health is when uh, a soldier is acting up you know, get into trouble, stuff mm -hmm. like that, and it's like, okay, well, you need to go see mental health, or usually yeah. alcohol related, which is just allowing you to access some uh, some doors you've got locked, yeah. right? Or it's just the uh, the soldiers that think they have PTSD and they're wanting to kind of like skip out of it, out of like going to training mm -hmm. or stuff like that. I mean, there there is those kinds, unfortunately. It does it does exist. There are um, there are one hundred percent people and. This is a tough one for me because it's tough. Like I describe when it comes to, in my own experience, I, I describe people as like a cup, right? And every cup is different and they all have a different volume and they have an ability to be drained. And then a lot of it has to do with your morals and your training and, you know, all of the things so that can help it drain quicker. But it's tough for me to say that shouldn't bother you because it doesn't bother me, right? Like that's the mistake you can get into. But having said that, I certainly have seen people who I'm going to call gaming the system mm -hmm. for it's because it's the it's the soup du jour term, right? If you say post traumatic stress, you mean there's a litany of things and programs that you now have access to, whether or not you actually have it, correct? Or not correct. Yeah, and one thing I, I just want to I want to clarify before we get down this rabbit hole is PTSD should not be a competition. You know, you, you have some of those guys be like, "Well, I was in I was in you know." situation worse than yours yeah okay well i'm not going to pat you on the back for it i will condone my sympathy for you but i'm not going to sit there and say yeah you definitely had it worse than me well, well that's that cup measuring thing right. right because you don't know you cannot tell by looking at somebody a how much volume their cup can hold and b the current level of water in that cup right because if you're right at the top it could take something super minor and you're spilling out you know and if you're empty you could tolerate a lot more and then you could at some point in your career your cup would be really really full and something that wouldn't have bothered you before with so you know what i mean it's it's really 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 hard to describe and it's variable in, in every person i think at all times right yeah and you know the funny thing about it is so my deployment from you know 2007 you know that time frame between 2007 and 2012 i had five years to where i could go out and reach out and help people mm -hmm. or help myself sorry uh, and I never did that. I had, uh, there were issues, you know, even when I was at Fort Leavenworth where I was like having fits, fits of road rage, mm -hmm. uh, I'd get just pissed off at literally nothing. I was just getting pissed off. I was going to ask you how far back do you, looking back now, recognize a change in yourself? Oh yeah. Um, I, this is kind of embarrassing, but I, I was playing a video game once and I literally like, I got so pissed off playing a video game where I snapped a PlayStation controller in half, which is almost impossible. But my adrenaline spike was that high, where I literally just snapped it in half, and I yeah. was going, huh, "I'll just go buy another one." Like I didn't really give any thought. Like maybe you should go, yeah, and seek some help and get this sorted out before you cause some serious harm to yourself or somebody else. You know, 
Uh, so, you know, it's it's one of those realizations that could, we're not realizing re- realizing is you know being in, in in an infantry unit, it's easy to really suppress some of that stuff when you go back into training when you're back in the firing range because that adrenaline's kind of spiking back up, mm-hmm. and so you start suppressing everything, and it, it becomes pretty easy at that point to suppress it. And then you realize uh, chicken has come home to roost. Eventually, it's it's just going to come out, and it's going to be even worse than before. Did you have a moment of realization like that? Uh, a couple months ago, actually. Yeah, it was uh, hard hitting. Like, and it and initiated from Memorial Day for whatever reason. It hit me harder than yep. than it's ever hit me. Uh, typically, it's like. Well, this day kind of sucks, and I'm gonna have a beer for those that didn't come home. Yep. But this time it was like it was harder, um, and I I don't know why I can't describe it. And it just it's just it, the more I tried to suppress that, the more it compounded on itself, and that's when it really hit me a couple months ago, and I literally like, like broke down, like I was not in a sense of crying, you know, myself to sleep or anything like that, but it was the fact that I wasn't sleeping. I knew I was having issues. I was building up a wall, of, you know, people around me. Mm-hmm. I was making excuses and not going to jujitsu. Um, I was focusing more on being at work and anything because I was using that as an excuse not to go to jujitsu. Yeah, you become very task oriented. Yeah, and uh, you, you start to kind of push people away, you know. And for whatever reason, I don't know. Um, but um, yeah, it was a really stark realization. Like even my girlfriend at the time. I, I didn't want to be around her. Like, mm. well, what's what's up with that? You know. And I asked myself, like, what are you what are you doing? And her and I would have conversations about it. And she goes, Well, you need to see somebody. I'm like, no, no, I don't need to see anybody. And yeah, yeah, you do, jackass. Go go see somebody. And so uh, shortly after that, I I made an appointment at the vet center with some really cool cool counselors. And uh, my counselor right now, he's a former soft dude, special operations guy, uh, ranger. Um, broke his back when he was out of the military, and so now he he's uh, paralyzed from the waist down. Mm-hmm. But super cool dude. I mean, like he gets it. And being able to kind of discuss my issues um, has relieved all this pressure, uh, surprisingly. And I'm going to keep doing it. It's not something I'm going to stop for sure. Has the uh, even just a, an immense amount of relief just by verbalizing the things that you hadn't verbalized before? Oh yeah, um, and I I had actually saw somebody uh, counseling uh, about a year ago, and I told myself, oh I'm good, I'll stop seeing a counselor. And in fact, it made things worse. I started suppressing everything again. Yeah. Without realizing until it came into fruition a couple months ago. Talk to me about how jujitsu helped you. Or oh. has helped you, or is continuing to help you. Whatever terminology you would use, it's, it's definitely helped me. Uh, and the reason why it helped me is uh, it's a path of unknown because uh, you can't you can't predict as a as a white belt. And just speaking on just on my behalf, yeah. Um, for clarity, neither well, Aaron knows more than me, but I would say neither of us know what the hell we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> we we could watch a video and go, maybe he should have. No, never mind. Yeah, uh, but yeah, um, definitely don't know what the hell I'm doing. Uh, but. Uh, it's definitely you know you roll with somebody and it's an, it's an unknown factor which kind of unclogs the mind because you get you you can kind of get in the sense of uh, routine like even going lifting was actually kind of like eh mm-hmm. like I would set kind of like a weight goal for myself and I would hit it and be like all right what's next like it's not really challenging I mean it is I mean I can make an outrageous number and go go hit that and it would take me like six mo- six months to get there. Um, but jujitsu gives you an instant feedback, whereas nothing else really does. I mean, it's just it's constant. And it's really physically hard. Yes, too, it is. Yeah, because I think there is a com- there has to be. From what I've seen, um, the people who combine um, talking with so maybe it's not even a specialist. Maybe they just have an understanding spouse that is a sponge that can absorb without judgment, which is not always the case for clarity. Uh, but that physical release as well, I have seen that be um, an on-ramp at least towards uh, an enhanced, I don't want to say recovery, because I don't know if that's the right term when it comes to post-traumatic stress. I don't know if it ever goes away. Uh, but it, 
health at least mental health well you're, you're you know with any exercise like you you release those endorphins which is what's you know key for your body i mean you you, you feel good you look good and that's kind of like a, an instant like positive feedback for your brain and you need that like you, your brain craves that and the other thing i, I want to point out too is uh, i really most i'm not gonna say most um i myself had a issue with not wanting to connect with anybody outside the military like the civilian world is like this completely different mm. world now. It's not something that I I'm comfortable with anymore. Uh, it doesn't seem tangent. Like I can't seem to grasp anything on it. And so anytime I I'd, I'd start to kind of build myself around people, um, kind of a tribe, I would start to kind of push myself away. Like nah, that's that doesn't feel right. That's 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 not. I don't belong here. Um, and. We as a human species, we need that that tribe mentality to survive. We are not built to survive on our own, and that's just that's historically accurate all the way through time. Um, that's the reason why you know people get married. That's the reason why people procreate, you know, have kids, uh, grow themselves, and you know, back in the, I would even say back in my high school years. Uh, when I lived in Rexford, people were really close to each other. You know, you, you had parents that would be like, hey, you're not supposed to be doing that, kid. And you were like, okay, well, yeah, I'm not supposed to be doing that. Please don't <laughs> tell my folks. Uh, and of course they would. And you'd get back home and you get your butt cheat out. But um, anymore, uh, with the media and social media, I would say, uh, we've become less connected, I would I would say, versus be more connected. Digitally more connected, but I think at a personal level, it just takes us farther and farther away. Right. And so it's it's that kind of like fake feedback or that fake uh, um, acceptance, if you will, from a person through a screen versus you know, being face to face with somebody. Yeah. And it, it's come to a hard, hard realization for me that I, I need to surround myself with good people. It's made me feel a lot better. It makes me feel more confident with being able to operate. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to see, I don't want to seem so militaristic, but, um, coincide with civilian society yeah. it's okay people function. accept you function yeah, yeah exactly and for whatever reason i wanted to kind of pull away from that and i'm like well that doesn't make any sense i think that's pretty common in tight uh tight-knit communities i have family in the fire service and it seems like they largely uh intermix with mainly fire service and what do you end up talking about when you're a bunch of with a bunch of people that you work with work right, right. so it becomes who you are as opposed to what you do i've seen the same thing uh, on the law enforcement side, and I don't make a judgment about that. It just seems to be that those tight knit communities do that because they have a different context or value of how they view the world. Yeah, you know, and they're seeking out people who see it in the same way. And that that's got to be tough getting out of the military and geographically isolating yourself as well too away from that network because even talking to somebody over the phone, I think it's less powerful than like you and I sitting here right now talking face to face. I mean, it's a struggle. For sure, it, it is, and I, I, you know, it's really easy to um, kind of paint yourself this this picture that's better than what it is. Like, like speaking over the phone. Like, I have a really good buddy of mine. And I, I've, I've not talked about him before. Duff, he and I were squad leaders together in uh, in, I, in Iraq. Um, but we'll we'll chit chat over the phone. Um, but sometimes I feel myself kind of pulling away from what's really bothering me, mm -hmm. or what's really the truth of the matter. It's like, hey, what's going on? Oh, nothing. Just having a beer. Yeah, everything's good. Everything's good. Everything's peachy. <laughs> uh, like for a prime example, uh, I don't want to say his name because I'm, I'm not sure how his family feels about it. But uh, I just talked to a buddy of mine who took his life um, uh, last Sunday, or I found out last Sunday rather, and I spoke to him like two months prior to that, and everything seemed to be peach keen everything was smooth well you put a post up um recently saying that you've had 11 friends now that have uh, made the decision to take their life is that since you have gotten out of the military out of the military out of uh, four year four almost four and a half years now 11 per personnel have taken their own lives so looking back with the view that you have now and doing the work that you are doing now to improve your own health how many people do you think were in the same boat that you were in and didn't say anything about it. Oh, a hundred percent all of them. Yeah, I know. I was thinking about this. Um, I tend to agree with you. What do you think the odds are that you can actually go to war and not have it change you as a person? I think it's a pretty low percentage. Um, I think there are personnel out there 
that are able to go and do that job, come back, and not necessarily brush things off, but actually able to um, recolocate being back home, you know, yeah. being with family. and Well, the ability to do that and being a different person are two different things. You know what I'm saying? I actually think, I've been thinking a lot about this because I knew we were going to sit down. I don't know if it's possible to go to a war zone and actively participate in it and not have it change you as a person. I think if you're able to go there and you come back exactly the same way that you were before, I think that means you're a sociopath. I would agree. Because it has to, if you leave there without any changes, I think you're leaving there the ability to truly ever love again or hate again. It, because, you know what I mean? It's just, it's it's lost in that moment. I don't think it's possible. I think we all deal with it in our own ways. Um, like, I don't know where I sit on the post-traumatic stress uh architecture or the, the the not a paradigm the story arc of what is a low to moderate to high you know so i got medically retired and part of it was 30 days at a center called nico attached to walter reed which is the national intrepid center of excellence and i had to talk to psychologists and psychiatrists like every day mm -hmm. essentially and i just made a rule of myself that i would answer all their questions honestly all the questionnaires honestly and some of the questions and some of the questionnaires they're very broad is my Probably the most uh, pinpoint example of that is, you know, one of the questions that they would ask, it was on a questionnaire, do you ever think about things that happened um, while you were overseas? And the answer was yes. And, they, and the follow-up question is, well, how often? Well, every day. But some of the things that I think about, I'm laughing my ass off because it was the funniest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Right. When you see a guy sprinting through a courtyard get clotheslined by a literal clothesline under night vision goggles, that's awesome. Oh, yeah. And I think about that all the time. Right. <laughs> and then I also um, will think about, uh, you know, like I was telling you, like some of the worst things I ever saw was the treatment of their own people or the conditions that they were living in. And it's just, you know, there's carnage. At yep. Bottom line, there's going to be carnage. War is not a broadsword. It's not a scalpel. It's a it's a balloon filled with paint, and it gets on fucking everything. Yeah. And and so, yeah, I do think about all that. So I answer the questions honestly. Um you know, and if I and if I gauge myself off of the the things you see in the movies, right? Punching the wall, screaming at yourself in the mirror, jumping up from sleep, like I don't have any of that. I don't either. Like I don't I don't have those those kinds of outbursts. And I, anymore. But, and I don't know how often those things are, and that's where it gets really muddy and you know, because people watch a lot of T V or movies and they see those things, so it becomes stigmatized, which is why I hate the D associated with post-traumatic stress. It's not a disorder. Like I was saying, I think I've truly come to the conclusion that it is a natural thing. If you don't come back a changed person or with some issues that you need to work through, then I think you're a sociopath because yeah. you can't experience that. I mean, if you do come back that way, you need to watch out because it's somewhere along the line, it's going to come out whether you want to accept it or not. And I left NICO with a, a moderate diagnosis of post-traumatic stress. And I don't know what that means. Because I also have uh, TBI, and I'm sure you do too yep. from the blast. Yep. And I'll mess this up a little bit because I'm paraphrasing with people with advanced degrees were telling me. But TBI and post-traumatic stress, stress, I believe, have about 15 symptoms each. But the issue is 13 of them are shared. So I don't, I mean, I don't know. I don't feel, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I mean, I think we all can get road rage a little bit. Uh, you know, sometimes I'll definitely have issues escalating and controlling my anger. It'll go from zero to a 50, but I can catch it, right? So I don't have outbursts. Um, some things frustrate me more than, than they should. I've definitely d uh, dove into tasks instead of things that are bothering me. Um, and sometimes it hits me hard, like going to the Vietnam War Memorial there. It was crazy. There was these buses that were coming, and they were taking... Uh, Korean war vets, all of them in wheelchairs, past the Vietnam Memorial on the way to the Korean Memorial. I just, right. It just rocked me. Right? Yeah. And I'm just, I was there. I just wanted to take a picture of it and kind of just take it all in because I happen to be near there and I, and I enjoy going to the National Mall anytime that I'm close. Right. So there's residual there for sure. And I just, I don't know. I think we're all dealing with it. And the people that worry me are the ones that don't say anything. Like we were talking about on text, like I don't. I don't think I know eleven people who have gone down the route of taking their own life, but I know a couple for sure. And it just it scares the crap out of me. And I think it's because they're just not 
it's because they it's just associated with a disorder. It's associated with a stigma. They don't. I mean, when you realized you wanted to go and seek somebody out and talk to them about getting help, was that an easy process or a hard process? Did you go through the military? or Did you go private sector? I went private. How would it? Okay, so that I'm assuming then that was relatively quick. Yeah. Um, do you have any idea how it would be if you went through the military? Like you tried to go through the VA to get that type of stuff, or did you have any of, of any of the eleven people that you knew? Were they actively involved in that process, or were they avoiding it? Uh, that I I don't know. Uh, I really don't know. Um, I I do know that for whatever reason, um, the VA gets such a bad bad rep, and partially deserved, depending on geographically and the. It definitely yeah. is, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be fair to say I think it's the clinics um, that cause that, not necessarily the main hospitals. I've been to the main hospitals. I've been to one in Helena, Fort Harrison. Super cool place. Uh, been in the one in uh, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Super cool place. Mm-hmm. It just seems to me like the clinics are the ones that have the most issues. And for whatever reason, uh, I don't know, and I'm not going to speculate as the reason why. And so I think that's the reason why a lot of guys don't go there is because they don't feel like they're getting the help that they need. Yeah. But what they fail to realize is there are vet centers, whereas you take your DD-214 in, you know, and say, "Hey, I'm a veteran. I need to see somebody." They have counselors that are that are more than willing to, you know, make a block of time for you to come in and, and talk to them. And so, uh, I I reached out a year ago to the vet center off of a Meridian here in Kalispell. And as soon as I felt like I I had what I had, then I was done. But then, obviously, I went back in a couple months, you know, a couple mm-hmm. months ago, and I'm I'm not going to stop going. I'm just not. It's just it's been super beneficial for me. So um, there is that that outsource, and it's not just the VA. There is a vet center which is closely yeah. linked, but not the same thing. Yeah, I don't know if it, I think it's something that will carry for life. Is my is my assumption, but I also had the realization of when I was thinking about just myself. I I mean, I think war actually changed me for the better as well. People want to focus on the cliche outbursts and the, the negative aspect of post-traumatic post-traumatic stress and again and anybody who knows anything about me I'm obviously not a doctor so I'm talking out of my ass right now my own experience but I think there's some positive from it as well I mean I can tell you that I mean I definitely appreciate things so much at a, at a such a deeper level than I did uh, prior to going to war and I honestly think that I, I'm capable of loving at a deeper level than I was prior to going overseas. Like it hasn't all been negative. I, it, I mean, there's a lot of the things that came from the service, like an understanding of discipline and integrity and hard work, all that stuff. Like right. you know, it's the hallmark card that's probably painted on the walls of every boot camp of every service ever. Right. You know, Navy honor, courage, and commitment. And then whether you live that is completely different. Right. But right. you at yeah. least learn about it. Yeah. But it's. Uh, I just think there's two sides to the post-traumatic stress coin. And I'm not saying that the the bad side isn't utterly terrible, but I think if you can embrace the fact that it has an impact on you, at least you'll take an objective look at what you can do with it. I I, I know that I am a changed person, and in, as far as my military career goes, I say this all the time. I give myself a C, average, right? I've done more than some people and way less than most, but it changed me for sure. And I wouldn't be I wouldn't be sitting here today, I don't think, if it wasn't for those experiences. So I don't think you should throw the baby out with the bathwater. As, as I guess what the long-winded point that I'm getting myself to. I I've, I definitely consider myself a lot more resilient, uh, for sure. Yeah. Um, not necessarily in a, in a bad way. Like I'm not like freaking out. You know, every time I walk into a building, I'm like, oh, well, there, there's an exit, there's an entry. Oh my god, I have to be. You know, my back has to be at a wall. Um, I've actually got to be a lot more calmer about that over the years and especially within the past few months i've told myself I'm like i'm not i'm not in a hostile environment yeah um, i actually found myself or find myself i have a enhanced ability for compassion yeah and tolerance of people being dumbass yeah the issue is if it gets dumped into fifth gear it's probably going to accelerate from zero to very very fast very very fast but i've actually found because again it's that um experience and objectivity of seeing and just like oh you know what i mean it's just not worth it no yeah it, it's not 
uh, it's like for my biological father, uh, he and I got into a physical confrontation, and I was drunk at the time, but I remember it clear as day. Uh, it was uh, it was like a few months after I had been medicaled out, and I was sitting there at my sister's house, and he was living with her at the time, and I had little, almost little to no respect for the man after finding out all of the history and everything mm-hmm. that he told me was, was all bullshit. You got through the facade. Yeah, and... Uh, he, the the funny thing about it is, is he confronted me and he was like, uh, well, you you think you got out of E7, you think you're better than me. And I was like, actually, no, I am better than you. And not because of the E7. Not because of the E7. <laughs> um, and so he and I kind of went back in this like verbal tiff and I was like, you know what? I was like, if you want to throw down, let's just throw down. Let's just do it. I was like, because I'm tired of this shit. And I was like, I'm not 15 years old anymore. I was like, I will break you. And he came at me, and I Spartan kicked him, like, over the couch. And he got up, and, like, he was done. I thought that he was completely over with it. And so I went back to drink my beer, like, nothing ever happened. Like, I, could just, I just laughed it off. Yeah. And next thing I know, he runs over to the kitchen and pulls a knife out of the knife block. And so my first reaction was jump over the counter, put him in a rear naked choke, which I'm more proficient at now than I was back then. Yeah. And I made him drop that knife. And I told my sister, like, call the cops. Call the cops right now. And I said, I will not let him up until you call the cops. Jesus, man. And she called the cops. And, of course, you know, I let him up. And he goes sprinting out the back door. And he's jumping through the freaking neighborhood. No way. Yeah, just completely just lost his gourd. And I I grabbed the knife by the blade. And I went out onto the driveway. And I put the knife on the driveway. And I sat there on my knees and just waited for the cops to show up. And my sister was kind of, like, freaking out. Like, what are you doing? I was like, there's a weapon involved. The first thing you're going to do is try and secure the situation. Yeah. And I was like, that's just bottom line. That's rule number one. If anybody knows anything about law enforcement or military or anything like that, they want to, like, quell the threat as fast as possible. And so the only thing I can do is comply. And she goes, well, they're going to arrest you. I was like, yeah, they probably are. Initially, and you work your way out of that later. Yeah. Yeah. And so they did. And, of course, I had to, like, write a a report. And they they sent me to uh, um, the Castle Police, like, had me write out a, out a, a uh, report, and so I did. And of course, there were like multiple finger fingerprints on the handles, so they couldn't like prosecute. Mm. And I was like, it "Is what it is." And she wound up like kicking him out of the house and that that sort of thing. But after that, I was like, "I will have nothing to do with that man whatsoever." I was like, "The next time I see him, I'm probably going to shoot him in the face." I don't advise you do that. No, I don't, I don't either. Be a strong call. I don't either. Yeah, but um, yeah, I mean, the guy is just. He's not healthy in any any facet. He's just, and that's one of the things. Uh, I went to uh, jujitsu camp uh, a few weeks ago, and Coach. I know you lucky bastard. It was awesome. Uh, Coach Coach Paul Sharp Sharp was talking about letting go of the rope. Is he the ex police officer? Yeah, former SWAT. Okay, that's yeah. what I thought. I've heard his name a few times. Yeah, super cool dude. Um, but yeah, he was talking about letting go of the rope. You know, you could do this tug of war with people, and uh, I find that to be true especially with people that you surround yourself with um those that are on that negative spectrum you know they love to feed off your positive vibe and take that away from you mm-hmm. and kind of fill you with as much drama as they possibly can in order to whatever fill whatever source of satisfaction for themselves and i refuse to play that game anymore i'm just getting to that, that point where i'm like you know what you can go off and do your own thing and just leave me out of it. I don't. I don't want to be involved anymore. I think that's the healthiest way you can do it, man. And uh, yeah, otherwise you're just going to be dragging yourself down into the to their world, which is their goal anyway. Right. So, um, were there any common threads between the eleven people that chose to take their own life, other than service? Did you see any? Looking back, obviously, warning signs. Anything that was common that might give people who are listening to this and because I mean. Like my wife didn't serve in the military, but she kind of did, you know, yeah. she's exposed to it. She probably sees the shift in my personality or the ebb and flow or the sign, however you'd want to describe it, of who I am throughout days, weeks, years, the course of our life. Um, and she, I'm in, in all honesty, she would probably recognize a shift in me faster than I would recognize a shift in me or a change in behavior. Did you, in talking with uh, the friends or family or any any of those 11 situations, was there any common threads looking back that you can piece together? Uh, the one thing I could definitely uh, say for sure is alcohol was uh, 
a helpful component. Um, and don't get me wrong, like I, I love a good, you know, sip of whiskey every now and then. Like I, I love a good beer every now and then. Um, but moderation is everything. Uh, anytime you start to overuse, uh, if you feel the need or the compel to have a beer, like initially when you get off work and have like multiple in one sitting, that should be a telltale sign. Uh, especially if you're doing it by yourself. That should definitely be a red flag. So the isolation aspect of that? For sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, th- I think alcohol should be more of on a celeb- celebratory scale yeah. than anything. Um, so, and that's just my personal view on it. And uh, ever since my last episode, uh, I'm not going to lie, I had a couple of shots due to Coach Leah's prescription on my knee uh, that I screwed up. But uh, after I had a couple shots, I was on like that night. She's nice. not a doctor. No. <laughs> <laughs> she was my doctor that night. Uh, yeah, she uh, she helped me out. So I was like on that nice, like, oh, the knee is. is uh, so that was like a pain uh, suppression prescription, though. Yeah. 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 And just, just two. Two is all I needed. And I yeah. was on that, that perfect perfect plane and after that like i haven't, I haven't had a, a beer or anything since well i mean it's good that you can recognize that in yourself as something that might fire off or trigger off the spiral right because i think it is a spiral i don't i mean again i think you have more experience with uh with friends in that avenue but from what i've seen and i think even in myself it's not a trap door it's a slower descent, right? You know, it's not like all of a sudden you're in free fall. It's one thing that builds to another. And I, I like the term momentum. I use it. People want to ask me about working out or getting, you know, farther down the road. It's the little steps that keep the momentum going in the positive direction. Managing the alcohol content, focusing on the positivity. It can go the other way too. Well, I, I think part of it is uh, on the suicide uh, level. Um, there's a lot of veterans that get out medically because they do have physical issues right Mm -hmm. and so uh, my experience with the VA every time that I went in for pain uh, and the only times I'd go in there is when my pain scale was like at an 8 out of the 10 I think I know where this is going uh, I would walk in and be like can you do anything for me is there any sort of like rehab that I could do and the first thing that they would say is well here's an opiate and I'm like you can take that opiate and you can shut up your ass Percocet or an Oxy yep and what happens uh for a few veterans is they'll gladly take that prescription and they'll get themselves pigeonholed and put themselves in like this mental prison like this is euphoric and my body's just accepting it and I'm perfectly happy and then it becomes supposedly. reliant on it and then you become reliant on it and then you're going well how do I become better that's the question um, and that's one of the failed processes that I've witnessed uh, when going to the VA was the physical rehabilitation side of it is their programs are lacking in that area. And so there's quite a few guys that need that help that they're just not getting. And so I took everything on my own uh, to kind of rehabilitate myself. And yeah, there are days where my pain scale is at a five. I'm not going to bullshit you. I mean, there's days that I'm at a six or seven. Yep. But I don't let that phase me. There's days that because my back hurts so bad that I just won't, I won't step on the mat. I'll sit on the sidelines. I'll take some notes. Um, but it is what it is. Like I'm not, it's not, it's not going to control me and I refuse to let it control me. And that's just how it is. I mean, I think that's good advice for post-traumatic stress in general. It, accept the fact that it's there and don't let it control you. Right. The, the first portion of that though, I think is being control. If you're a guy, uh, I'd say we have more ego problems than gals. Not that guys only get post-traumatic stress and gals don't. But check the ego a little bit and realize that, yeah, you're not Superman, right? You're not Adonis or whoever, you know, infallible character you think that you are. And then, I mean, recognize, it helps me for sure. I mean, it it's not easy to say, yes, I'm a changed person and not all the changes are positive. Because right. I've had shitty interactions with my kids because of it. But I've also had some very deep and loving and amazing interactions because of it. It's the same coin. It just ends up, you know, what side it's been flipped on. Right. You know, the VA thing about, I often, you know, in the modern day, I think there are plenty of places and avenues for people to go if they need help. But the the people have to realize nobody's going to do it for you. No. They could have the most amazing system right down the block, but if you're not willing to walk down the block and go in there, you can't point the finger at anybody other than yourself. And it's one thing that I, I'm i very critical of the veteran community about. 
it, you know, nobody owes you a thing. It nope. was a job that you volunteered for. We're yep. outside of the parameters of the draft. Yep. It's an amazing occupation, but don't sit there and hang your uniform in your office or in your closet and look at it every day and say, somebody owes me something for right. this. Like, right. If you have an issue, you need to get off your ass and do something about it. Because if not, you're going to go on that staircase, right? It goes down and down and down and down. And again, not being a doctor or a professional in that world, but I bet you there's a point where you may not be able to recover from. Yeah, you definitely have to acknowledge your situation and you really have to be honest with yourself. I think that's one of the toughest things a lot of people have just in general is just being honest with themselves. But you have to kind of catalog what's you know, mentally catalog or even take notes like what what am I doing different or how how is my uh, reaction to this and this and this affecting everything else in my life and go from there and be like, yeah, this is this is bad. This is not good. I, I need to figure out how to curb this if I can. Um, one thing that, that while going through counseling is what I'm trying to like dig into is how can I fight off any sort of initial urges that I might have, you know, and it's contact with, you know, TBI and PTSD mm. um, because your, your brain is, has these wires that are supposed to be interconnected. And sometimes that TBI will disconnect some of those wires to the rest of your brain. And so you become super reliant on this fight or flight moment in an aggressive stance, not nothing, nothing really in a positive manner whatsoever. Yeah. And so that's the reason why like uh, football players are having issues with, you know, these issues too. So it's, it's not just, you know, veterans going through it. Yeah. It's, professional sports players as well but uh yeah i mean you have to be super honest with yourself and be honest with those around you and saying hey this is this is what i'm dealing with and go and like you said get off your ass and go and seek that help yeah don't procrastinate with it it's only going to get worse easier said than done true statement cool let's close it there right on Thanks, everybody. That is it for this week. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you want to support the podcast, uh, I'm going to give you two ways that you can do it. One is to go to clearedhotpodcast.com, and I got a bunch of stuff there that says Cleared Hot on it. And the hope is is that you would wear one of those things, and then somebody would say, hey, what's Cleared Hot? And you'd say, oh, it's this podcast I listen to, and then maybe they would start listening to it as well. Um I say that kind of tongue-in-cheek. If you want to buy a T-shirt, knock yourself out. Uh, but the, probably one of the coolest things that you could do is either leave me a review on iTunes with comments if you want to, uh, good, bad, or ugly. If they're bad comments, uh, don't be afraid to put something up there that you don't like. If, if it's something that I can change, then I will. If it's something that I can't change, like the sound of my voice, then I'm not going to be able to. So the review and telling people about it are probably the biggest things. And then if you want to wear a t-shirt or a hat, that's awesome too. And you can get them at clearedhotpodcast.com. Uh, and another way you can kind of support what I am all about and what I stand for is through Free Range American. Like I said in the beginning, it's a brand about celebrating the things that we are so incredibly fortunate to have. And we got some cool line. To, I mean, I don't like saying it's an apparel brand because I think that it's more than that. I'd really like to think of it as something motivational that inspires people to get out and do awesome shit to use our mission statement. Uh, and that's it. Free range American. 